Um, In the scriptures today, I would like to share the majority of the scriptures that I'd like to look at with you this morning are found in the book of 2 Corinthians. And Paul, the apostle, wrote the book of 2 Corinthians to the church at Corinth. And we're going to read a big, large chunk of scripture today. And then we're going to kind of break it down. And Paul loved the church at Corinth. And this second letter was kind of like the way I look at it. Those of you who have had, you know, employment and, you know, currently have a job where you do like an end of the year evaluation. How many of you sometimes get a mid-year review? Somebody, somebody gets a mid-year review. My husband, like, sometimes gets a mid-year review. It's supposed to happen. And then, you know, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. When I look at this chapter, I kind of feel like Paul is doing a mid-year review. It's not really a year. But he's looking back at what he has already told them and saying, are we staying on track with this? And, well, we're kind of getting off track here. And you need reminded of this. And let me remind you what your purpose is. And let me remind you, you know, and he's kind of doing this Let's get back in focus. And there's no better time than the new year for us to have that focus. So it's not a mid-year review for us. It's a new year review. And I'm hoping that as we look at the scriptures today, we would be reminded of our purpose this morning. So if you have um, your paper Bible, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you use the Bible app, I encourage you to open to 2 Corinthians 5 because we are going to read a chunk of scriptures right now. So um, you can turn your attention to the screen, though, if you don't have something to read along with. And we're going to read from verses 14 through 21 together. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21. For Christ's love compels us. And we will talk about what Christ's love compels us to in just a few minutes. But Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Go on. All this is from God. All that Christ did for us is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Who is thankful that if your faith is in Jesus Christ, your sins are not counted against you? Amen? Not counting men's sins against him. And he has committed to us, he's going to repeat this, Paul wants to drive the point home, He's committed to us not just the ministry of reconciliation, but the message of reconciliation. In the next slide, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Of God. Does that passage get you as excited as it gets me this morning? It gets me excited. So we're going to back up and break it down a little bit, okay? So in verse 14, we read that Christ's love compels us because we are no longer, because we are now convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Verse 15, he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. I'm going to read the next verse, and we're going to go back. Do we have verse 16? Verse 16. So from, from now on, from now on, I think we kind of got, I got thrown off, but let me read this to you, verses 16 and 17. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. So that passage of scripture is just introducing to you and I this idea of purpose. This idea of purpose, that we were saved on purpose for purpose. We are not what we were. We are no longer our old selves, but we are a new creation. The new has come, and the new year has come, but I really want to talk about the new you. If you are in Christ, you are not the old you, you are the new you. Not saved to live for you, but for him. He made you on purpose, for purpose. Well, what is that purpose? Ashley, I know I jumped around a little bit, but we are jumping to verse 18, okay? Ashley and I are going to get this worked out. She's amazing. Can you clap for Ashley? 
She's amazing. So God made you on purpose for purpose, that we not should live not for ourselves, but for him. 2 Corinthians 5, 18a says, all this, all this, the new you, the old you being gone, the new you being here, this fact that you were made on purpose, for purpose, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, reconciled us to himself through Christ, and he didn't stop. There. Now, this idea of reconciled, we're going to talk about this, what this word actually means in a minute. But we were brought near into relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And they're, Paul's going to reiterate again, not just for ourselves, but the second part of the verse says, we were reconciled to himself through Christ, and then he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And this is what I want to talk about this morning. Most of us in this room, and if this is not you, I am so double glad that you are here. And I am going to be talking to you in just a moment. But most of us in this room have put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the forgiver of our sins and the savior of, savior of our soul. He did that to reconcile us into our relationship with God and, everybody say and, and, and to give us the ministry of reconciliation. What he ministered to us, he wants to minister through us. And y'all, I've got proof. You're still here. Okay? So if he was done, and as soon as you put faith in Jesus, the box was checked and mission accomplished, you and I would be face-to-face with him right now as we look forward to. Right? Right? But we're still here because he's given us this ministry of a reconciliation. He's not done with you or I. He made us on purpose for purpose. And the first purpose was to know him. And the second purpose was to make him known. And every one of us is invited into that ministry this morning. Now, this is the very ministry that was ministered unto you and I if we have put our faith in Jesus Christ. Someone loved you. Someone invited you. Someone prayed for you. Someone hunted you down. Someone listened to you. Someone sat and explained the scriptures to you. Someone told you the gospel of Jesus Christ and explained it to you. Someone gave you the opportunity, and maybe it was lots of opportunities before you took the opportunity to put faith in Jesus. And whether that was one someone or 20 someones that God used, those individuals were being a part of the ministry of reconciliation. So let's talk about what those words mean. I really like to define terms because it just makes our understanding so much deeper. So the word ministry would be related to the word minister. And my son and I, you can tell me later, buddy, he and I haven't had a time to talk about this message. You know, I kissed him this morning, woke him up and said, mommy's going to preach, pray for me, bye, you know. But this morning, or um, this week rather, he and I came across this word somewhere and Nathaniel said, that has a Latin root. We study um, some Latin at home, and some of you do, and I just find it so fun to find what words mean. So minister is a Latin word, and do you know what the word is in Latin? Minister, okay? And so it literally means, um, it means to assist, and specifically was used in context of the priest's assistant the priest's assistant, okay? And so you and I literally have been called to be the assistant of our high priest, Jesus. You and I, through no other credentials but the blood of Jesus, making us new creations in Jesus Christ, we have been called to this ministry of reconciliation. So the idea of minister was first the priest's assistant. Now, we know a lot of countries use this term with regards to a government assistant, right? We hear that. And then in America, we use this term, and and other nations do too, um, a church work assistant. And unfortunately, we, a lot of us have adopted the idea when we hear ministry or minister, we think someone who went to college to learn how to do that. Well, that's not what I'm talking about this morning, and that's not what Paul's talking about this morning, okay? There are people like our pastor who did go to Bible college to specifically shepherd a flock toward growth in knowing Jesus Christ and making him known, but he's not the only minister in the house. 
y'all, if you have faith in Jesus, are ministers in the house this morning, okay? So that's the idea of minister, and ministry just derives from that. It's the work of assisting. Assisting what? Reconciliation. So I want to talk about this word, reconciliation. The definition of reconciliation means to make oneself or another. So we can help someone else. So make oneself or another no longer opposed, no longer opposed. So we think of this when we've got interactions with people in our lives, right? And there's a, there's a tiff, there's an argument, there's a misunderstanding. We stand opposed. And until there's some repentance, somebody needs to be first. There's confession, there's forgiveness, and then there's reconciliation, right? And we've all been through that. Well, this ministry of reconciliation was modeled in us no longer being opposed and being separated from God the Father by what? What was it that was opposing us? Our sin, right? Our sin stands between us and the Father until faith is put in Jesus. So as ministers of reconciliation, can we do away with somebody's sin? No, 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 no. But we can guide and help toward faith in Christ so that that individual knows the newness that we know and they are no longer opposed. Brothers and sisters, you have been called to the ministry of reconciliation. If you are 10, wondering what God wants you to do with the rest of your life, if you are 42, am I, like I forget how old I am sometimes. If you are 42, knowing what God wants you to do for the rest of your life, regardless of where he has you do it and what it's called, it is the ministry of reconciliation. So 2 Corinthians 5.19 says this, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Now, right before that, in verse 18, it says, we were given the ministry of reconciliation. So Paul says, you were given this ministry. In verse 19, he wants to clarify what the ministry is, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. If you are like me and you are thankful your sins are not counted against you, would you just put your hands together? That is why we sing. That is why we clap. That is why we rejoice. That is why we're here. If our sins were still separating us from God the Father, we would, we would not be able to draw near. But we are able to draw near, and we want to see others draw near. In the second part of 519, Paul goes on to say, so not only has God been reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So verse 18 says he's given us the ministry of reconciliation, and he didn't stop there. He even went ahead and gave us the message of reconciliation. He doesn't want there to be any confusion here. And what is the message? It's clarified right there that God wants to reconcile the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. Church, there is a lot of confusion about this. Those who are far from God figure that's how God wants it. They've got too much junk anyway. He wouldn't want anything to do with them anyway. They've done too much or they're too far. They'd have to change too much. They're not worth it. Or that he's not there at all. There's much misunderstanding about the passion of God to reconcile the world to himself. They need to know and we need to tell them. And if you're in this room right now and that does not resonate with you and you think, oh, actually, I find myself in the category of I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. You don't know who I am. You don't know what I've done. Or I don't really have proof enough yet to believe that. Well, I'm speaking to you this morning too. It is my prayer that by the end of this message, you would know the depths of the riches of the love of God and the extent that he's gone to reconcile you to a relationship and not have junk between you and him. Amen? Amen? Amen. So he's given us the ministry of reconciliation so that there is not an opposition between us and, and him, and he's given us the message of reconciliation. So let's talk about message, right? There's a lot of messages that we send on a daily basis, okay? We send text who sends text messages, right? Who doesn't send text messages? We might send Facebook messages. We got all kinds of social media apps. We've got maps, or we've got apps for, did I say maps or apps? I don't even know. We got those too, right? Google Maps sent me a message. I did not plan to tell you this, but apparently I had some like feature set 
And on January 1st, Google Maps sent me a message of everywhere I went in 2019 and how many miles I had traveled and all the places I had visited. And I was like, that's cool and creepy. Cool and creepy. So I haven't told my husband yet. Right now, he's like, we are turning that off. You know, he, you know, like that. But Google Maps even did send me a message. But we send messages, text messages, voicemail messages. Where are my Post-it notes? If you know me, I'm famous for post note messages, okay? I have a whiteboard in the kitchen. We might, you know, give a phone call. Um, if we are, like, in some kind of, like, you know, high secretive level government job, I know there's, like, my son's cringing right now because I don't know the technical names, you know, but, like, Morse code is about as technical as I can get to you right now. But there's ways of sending, like, covert messages, you know what I'm saying? And depending on the um, importance of the message, we would choose an appropriate delivery method for the message, right? Like, I'm not going to text my husband happy anniversary and be done with it, right? Or, like, sticky note my son, happy birthday, you know, or like leave a note on my mom's car for Mother's Day, right? I'm going to choose an appropriate method to send the message based on what it is. Well, God does the same thing. And so this message of reconciliation was his most important message for the world, and he's chosen you to be the method of sharing that message. And, and that just makes my heart pound a little bit faster. He chose you and me, and we're just like broken right? And messed up. And every day realizing, oh, Lord, it is truly by your grace that I am saved. And yet this precious message that was proclaimed in the life and the death and the resurrection of his son, this message has not stopped to go forth since the day of Christ because of the church, you, the church, the ministers of reconciliation. Let's go on to verse 20. Paul wants to make sure we get it. We, we, those of us who have been given the ministry of reconciliation and the message of reconciliation, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Can you say ambassadors? We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Did you know when you said yes to Jesus, you became an ambassador? You became an ambassador, and it pays better than anything else you will ever do. You and I are called as a body, as a part of the body of Christ, to be a part of the worldwide team of ambassadors. So what is an ambassador? Okay, I'm all about definitions. You know I am. So let's look at what an ambassador is. What does this mean? Because y'all, you need to know your job description, right? An ambassador can be defined as a diplomatic official of the highest rank sent by one sovereign, okay? So it's a little less because this is just from the dictionary, okay? Sent by one sovereign or state to another as its resident representative. Okay, so what does that mean? It means this is not our home. You are not a resident of Georgia. I am not a resident of Georgia. My tent is here, but I am a resident of heaven. And as a resident representative, go ahead and clap for that. As a resident representative of the one sovereign, you and I are on official business. Official business. And we don't have to come up with the message. It's already been given to us, right? And he doesn't want you to do it like I would do it. And he doesn't want me to do it like you would do it. And he doesn't want all of us to be Pastor Daniel, okay? He wants you to do it where he has put you to do this ministry of reconciliation as his ambassador. Another definition of ambassador says an authorized messenger or representative, because of who you are in Christ, you are authorized. Have you ever been in that place at work where you're like, somebody needs to tell so-and-so something, but I'm probably not the, I'm, I'm not the person. I better go get, right? Because that's not, I mean, it's not that I don't want to help, but I'm not really qualified enough for that. And they might think I'm trying to step into somebody else's job. You've been there, right? I don't want to look like a, none of that. None of that, none of that. You, if you have put faith in Jesus Christ and the message of reconciliation has transformed you and you are not what you were, but you are a new creation, you've got the ministry of reconciliation and you are the authorized messenger or representative to your sphere of influence. 
Y'all, you can reach people. I never can. Your neighbors are not my neighbors, right? Your cousins are not my cousins. Your grocery store clerk might not be my grocery store clerk. So he's got you there for a reason, on purpose, for purpose. And he's got me where I am for a reason, on purpose, for purpose. Amen. 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 So let's read verse 20 again. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Is appeal kind of like a wishy-washy word? I mean, if you're appealing to somebody, are you kind of just suggesting? Uh, no. Are you kind of like, I kind of would love, no. You're appealing. You are petitioning. This is urgent. You are urging. You are compelling. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. What is the appeal? Go on. We implore you on Christ's behalf. So we might, by the grace of God, be cho- God's chosen method with his chosen ministry of reconciliation with his chosen message that he wants to reconcile the world to himself, but it is all, can you say all? All All on Christ's behalf for his glory. So we implore you on Christ's behalf. What do we implore you? Come to church. No. I mean, that's awesome, and there is so much to be gained from church. We implore you to good do deeds. Do good deeds. Good do deeds. That's what I said. Okay. Okay. That either, but do we implore others to do good deeds? That's not what we're saying. Do we implore others to dress a certain way, live a certain way, act a certain way, or do we keep the main thing the main thing? We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We know that if the junk is no longer in the way and there is no more opposition between our loved one or the grocery store clerk or the person we just met, whoever this soul is, we know if there is no more opposition between them and the father, the father can take care of the junk. Did the father take care of the junk in your life? Yeah? The Father is continually taking care of the junk in my life, right? The resident Holy Spirit, that's his job. We were not given the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We were given the ministry of the message of reconciliation. And so we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. God made him, him, Jesus, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that. Y'all, if you see so that in your Bible, circle it, okay, and don't miss it. So that, not just because. It's never just because with God, okay? So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. His plan is complete and total, okay? And and if you are not in a growing relationship with Jesus right now, I want you to know that his heart for us is about so much more than Well, I came to church because somebody invited me. You came to church because somebody cares about you and wants you to be reconciled to God so that in him you might know the righteousness of God, the cleansing of the love of Jesus, the cleansing of the blood of Jesus, and the newness where the old can go and the new can come. That's what you are invited to this morning. So we're ambassadors. What does an ambassador do when conducting his business? Well, you know, I mean, I don't know a whole lot of like government ambassadors, but I've met a few ambassadors for some, what's the word I want to use? Um, businesses. We'll use the word businesses, okay? And there are some businesses that actually use this term ambassadors. And these folks are passionate about what they are wanting to sell to you. Have you met them? Yes, they are good at what they do. Why? Because they prepare. They prepare and they present and they persuade. And you don't want it and that's okay. And the next time they come back prepared and they present and they persuade, right? And the next time you come back, they're, they're prepared for you and they present and they persuade. And eventually, if you see the need for what they're presenting to you, you're going to find a way in your budget to invest in what they want to sell you, right? We've been there, okay? It might be a new car. It might be a new mattress. It might be a new vacuum cleaner. How many of you have bought a vacuum cleaner because somebody kept coming to your door? Anybody? I've seen your Facebook posts, okay? There are some of you in this room. If 10 people will come see this vacuum demonstrated, I might get one, okay? I've seen you, all right? And so eventually, after they've prepared and they present and they persuade, 
the person who gets to make the decision might eventually come to decision. Is it the salesman's responsibility? No, right? That person makes the decision, but the salesman is just meant to prepare and present and persuade. I use that word salesman, and I want to make it really clear to you that that's not what you are. There's a place in Isaiah where we are told we are publishers of peace publishers of peace. This ministry of reconciliation you have, you don't have to convince anybody. You're not a salesman. You're just a publisher. Your life is a published document of the peace and the love of Jesus Christ. And so that's what, as ambassadors, we are called to do. Quite simply, we know God and we want to make him known. Now, I absolutely know, and I mentioned it earlier, that some of us hear this ministry and minister and we think, No, there's people who get paid for that, right? There's people who get paid for that, and that's their job. Paul did not have that attitude to the church at Corinth, and we get our structure for the church from the New Testament of the Word of God. And what Paul says in the next verse that begins chapter 6, but you know, the Bible was not written in chapters and verses. We just use that to keep track of things, okay? So the next thing Paul says, um, chapter 6 and verse 1, he's still talking to the church at Corinth, As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. He was calling the whole church not to miss the opportunity for ministry. The whole church he referred to as God's fellow workers. God's fellow workers. He didn't even call them his fellow workers. He didn't give a church name fellow workers. He didn't limit it to the city of Corinth. He just said as God's fellow workers, don't take this for granted. Don't miss this opportunity. The grace of Christ has been given to you, but for so much more than just you, don't receive God's grace and keep it all to yourself. That would be in vain. We are redeemed ourselves in order to reconcile others to the grace of the Lord Jesus. And you know, church, God is so abundantly good that he he can never be outgiven. He can never be outgiven. And so, let's take a drink real quick. So, This ministry of reconciliation is us serving and us pooling and us inviting and loving and compelling for others to know the new creation that they too can be in Jesus Christ. And that is all about them coming to know the Father. But did you know that because he's so good and he cannot be outgiven, that if you will listen to Paul's call and you will not take God's grace in vain and you will accept the invitation to be an ambassador and you will accept the charge toward the ministry of reconciliation, that you too will benefit because God's just that good. The ministry of reconciliation doesn't just have benefits for those we minister to. When we participate in the ministry of reconciliation, when we know God to the point that we want him to be made known, when we determine we will be ambassadors and we will share this message, our lives are changed too. And I want to share three ways. And these are three ways that I've seen him change my life, and if you are active in the ministry of reconciliation, you are seeing him change your life, and if you are sitting here knowing Jesus as your Savior, knowing that you've put your faith in him, but also knowing I'm not participating as God's fellow worker right now, I'm not active in the ministry of reconciliation, I I am kind of taking God's grace in vain right now. Listen, we've all been there too, so today I invite you to say, enough is enough, I'm not going to take it for granted anymore. I won't accept God's grace in vain. And these are just some of the beautiful ways that I believe you'll see God active in your life when you do. The first is that the ministry of reconciliation keeps my focus on him. The ministry of reconciliation keeps my focus on him. He becomes greater and I become less. It's not about me. And it's not about what I have to say. It's about the message of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.15, again, Paul says, And he, Christ, died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him. Raised again. When we're active in the ministry of reconciliation, it's just not about us anymore. In John 3.30, John the Baptist said about Jesus, He must become greater. 
I must become less. And when we put God's priority as our priority, that just happens. It just happens that he becomes greater. And there's so much joy that accompanies that. The second benefit that I want to mention to you today about participating as an ambassador in the ministry of reconciliation is it keep, keeps our hands to the plow. It keeps our hands to the plow. Now, what does that mean? In Luke 9, 62, Jesus says, and, and he's speaking to those who want to come after him. When you read the scriptures, context is so important, okay? So what he says, he's saying to those who want to be known as followers of him, and so he wants to clarify, and he says, okay, no one who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back and kind of gets bored and disengages, I'm adding, I'm paraphrasing, but Jesus said no one who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. When we keep our hand to the plow, when we are active in the ministry of reconciliation, when we are active, City Church Pooler, in making space so that people can encounter a life-saving relationship with Jesus, when you're active making space at your dining room table so your neighbor can encounter the life-saving message of Jesus, when you're active making space in your calendar so that you can minister to those who need the life-saving message of Jesus, just the grace of Jesus, your hand is to the plow. When your hand is to the plow, it can't get mixed up doing the wrong thing, can it? It's busy about the Father's business. And so when we're part of the ministry of reconciliation, it keeps our hands to the plow. We're doing the right thing, the main thing. And finally, the ministry of reconciliation will give you beautiful feet. And for me, this is one of the only ways I'm going to have a claim toward beautiful feet, okay? Let me read to you from Romans chapter 10. Verses 14 and 15. How then can they? Now, they right here is specifically making a distinction. They're, they want to, if you go back and read, and it's believed that Paul's the author here, but if you go back and read, this is referring to Jews and Gentiles. This is for everybody, everybody who doesn't yet know. How can they? So we don't live in a world that really is distinctive between Jews and Gentiles, but we do live in 2020 where it's believers, unbelievers, uh, people who have been to church, haven't been to church. We, we separate in different distinctive categories, okay? Well, they're all they. They're all they right now, okay? How then can they, and I want you to think of who your they is. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent as it is written? And now we have a reference toward an Old Testament passage. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Let me read you that whole passage out of Isaiah 52 verse 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace. And in another version it says, who are publishers of peace, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. When you are part of the ministry of reconciliation, you have beautiful feet. Well, what does that really mean? It means that you're walking the steps God would have you to walk and you're bringing the message God would have you to bring and his favor follows you. I mean, everything is butterfly and roses, okay? But he goes for you even on the mountains, okay? The mountains are no easy cakewalk, are they? But if he takes you to the mountain or if he takes you to the valley and you are there with the ministry of reconciliation, you have beautiful feet, beautiful feet, not, not, not rugged feet, not aching feet, not sore feet. I got home, I judged the speech tournament yesterday and I wore entirely too high of a heel all day yesterday, okay? And I got home and said, right, my feet hurt and I took those shoes off and and that's in the physical sense but in the spiritual sense when you're busy about the ministry of reconciliation and you are bringing the good news oh your feet feel beautiful your feet feel good your feet feel like dancing Brandy said amen how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good, good news who proclaim peace who bring good tidings who proclaim salvation and who say to Zion your God reigns now, church, I believe there's a, three groups of us in the room this morning, okay? The first group is like, oh, yes, 
the word of God makes it clear I am called to this ministry of reconciliation and that is what I want my life's heartbeat to be about and daily I will ask the Lord to fill my mouth and lead my feet amen and there are others of us in the room today that maybe you are somewhat new in your relationship with Jesus and this is a lightning bolt moment for you the flashlight just went on and you thought wow I didn't know that I was saved for purpose. I mean, I'm so glad to be made new in Jesus Christ, but you're telling me it's not over yet. This is just the beginning of an adventure where I get to participate with God? Yes. And so if that's new information, I just encourage you to partner with other believers in Jesus, to dig deeper into the word of God, to find out who you are in him, and to have fun. Your beautiful feet are gonna take you where my beautiful feet can't take me. You don't need You don't need 10 years to be ready. You don't need 10 months to be ready. You need a heart submitted to God because he's given you the ministry of reconciliation and the message of reconciliation.